I remember the day that I got accepted to Yale. I remember where I was sitting. I remember what I did. I remember who I called. But I also remember the day that I got rejected from similar schools a few years before. So in this video, what I wanna do is give you advice on how to have those accepted days and not the rejected days as we go over four main areas of your application to graduate school and what you can do to optimize it. Hi, I'm Craig and welcome to Market Power where we look at the power of markets and economics to shape our world. So go ahead and subscribe. If you're interested in some of that economics content, I have a PhD from Yale in economics. And if you're thinking, hold on a second, I'm not interested in getting a PhD and I'm not interested in economics. Well, stay tuned because the tips that I'm giving apply to any graduate school application that you're going to be doing. And I feel like these were really hard won tips that I have because when I was in high school, I applied to some of those top schools like Stanford, Harvard, MIT, and I got rejected from all of them. Now, I ended up going to a nice private undergraduate university and I had 150% scholarship. That means every semester they gave me the full tuition plus 50% of tuition on top of that that I could spend on whatever I wanted. I came out of high school a pretty good student and I had good options, but I didn't stand out when I was applying to some of those top tier schools. And so because of that, I spent my undergraduate making sure that I was ready to apply to top programs when I went and applied for my PhD program. Before I go into these four areas of the application, let me just point out that I went straight from my undergraduate into a PhD program, and that is common in economics. It's common to go straight into the PhD program. You don't need a master's. You get a master's on the way. They kind of just throw one at you to make sure you have something to show for the time that you've been at your school, but you don't have to have a master's to go and get to a PhD. Now, some people will apply to a master's program, so that way they can get you know, a little bit of a competitive edge or they can tool up. Maybe they didn't do as much in their undergraduate and so they're looking for that stepping stone to get into a PhD program, but you don't have to have that master's degree. But like I said, these tips are gonna apply to most master's programs as you are going through the application process. So let me go through these four areas. The first two, we're gonna just talk about setting the bar. The second two, we're gonna talk about how you make yourself stand out. So let's go on to that first one, the GRE. You have to take the GRE to get into graduate school. It is just what you do. Now, some people have asked me, should I take the GRE or the GMAT? The GMAT is used for business schools. The GRE is used for graduate schools generally. And it turns out that most programs, even business programs, are accepting the GRE now. So make sure you take the GRE. What is an economics program going to expect out of your GRE? They're gonna expect a perfect score on the math. Now that's not a hard and fast rule. I have a friend who did not get a perfect score on the math GRE and he still got accepted to Stanford and Chicago, which are both top tier economics programs. So it's not a make or break issue. But if you wanna make sure that you're just clearing that bar and making sure that you make it past the first filter, you wanna get that perfect score on the math GRE. How do you do that? Just lots of practice. That's the nice thing is that the math GRE, if you practice and you prepare, you can actually do really well on it. What did I do? I took a practice math test every week for months leading up to the GRE. Once a week, I would sit down and go through a practice math GRE and figure out how I was doing, what my progress was. And then of course I would study for it on the other days, but what this really helped me do is identify the types of questions that were hard for me. I figured out that graphing questions were a little bit difficult for me. I don't know why that was, maybe because of the testing environment, but I figured out that I need to make sure I give a lot of care to the graphing questions. I also found out that I was a little too hasty, that I was rushing through the exam, and that I was missing some really easy things that I could have caught if I had taken a second. And so one of the strategies I developed was making sure I counted to five every time I finished a question, giving myself time to calm down and know that I had answered that last question correctly. So those kind of things, if you can get yourself used to taking the test and figuring out what your weaknesses are, you can address those all the way up. And it turns out learning the math GRE 
is pretty easy. You want to do well on the verbal GRE as well, but most programs aren't going to put that much weight on it. They care most about your math GRE. The second part of your application is going to be the transcript. Again, this is really a clearing the bar type thing. You're going to want to take your economics classes and you're going to want to take your math classes and you're going to want to do well in them. So economics classes, hopefully if you're studying for economics, this is why you're going to graduate school is that you've taken economics classes. They are not necessary, I guess. There are some people who will take math or physics as their undergraduate and then they go to a graduate program in economics. But most people are taking economics as undergraduates. And then you'll want to take math classes because when you get to a graduate program in economics, there's a lot of math. Like I said, a lot of master students are taking those classes so that way they can get the math classes that they missed when they were an undergraduate. So if you can get those as an undergraduate, you have a better chance at succeeding when you get to those programs. And it's gonna be really important. You have lots of deep math that you have to understand in a graduate school program. And when you write a dissertation, you will often be required to use math in a way that nobody has thought of before. So that way you can solve problems that people have not solved. So the kind of math classes that you need to have are calculus one through three, a linear algebra class, and then real analysis of some sort. And of course you can fill this in with other classes, but those are gonna be the ones that they're really looking for when they're going through your transcript. And of course they want you to do well. Like I said, those two parts of your application are just the minimum. They're gonna make sure that you pass those before they really go on to these other two parts of your application. So make sure that you've covered those. But the third part of your application is gonna be your letters of recommendation. This is your first opportunity to shine because these, this is how you stand out. And here is the secret. This is the key to your letters of recommendation. They need to say something that your transcript doesn't. Imagine you go to a professor and say, I want a letter of recommendation. And you did well in that class and the professor says, sure, great, writes the letter. And the only thing this professor says is, this student did well in my class. We already know that from your transcript. That's something that we already know. So the marginal value of that letter of recommendation is zero. It's adding nothing. You need a letter that says something that I can't find out through any other way. And that could be something like, I, this student has talked to me about research and I think they have good ideas. This student wrote a paper for me that really stood out and was better than any paper I've had in the last five years. Something where that's not going to be captured in your transcript. And you can strategize around this. I knew who I wanted to write one of my letters of recommendation and so I had taken a class from him and then I made sure I took his advanced class a year later. And in both of these classes, I wrote papers that I believe went above and beyond what you would normally get in those classes. And I tried really hard to make sure that these papers stood out. Then when I went and asked for my letter of recommendation, I reminded him about those papers. I said, hey, just a reminder, I wrote that paper here and the second paper in the class I wrote about this. So that way he would remember the kind of things that he could put into that letter of recommendation. So make sure that you're fostering relationships with professors and you're choosing the kind of professors that can say something a little bit deeper than this student did well in my class. The fourth area of your application is going to be your statement of purpose. And this is like the letters of recommendation, except you have full control over what goes in here. And I think that this is one of the most botched areas of the application is the statement of purpose. Now, when I applied to schools as in high school, I remember the statement of purpose I wrote and I cringe thinking about what I put in there. It was this like allegory of me running around the track because I ran track at the time and I was looking at people along the fence and like the impacts they had on my life. It was very prosaic, it was very flowery. It doesn't make you stand out, okay? I see these kind of examples all the time and no one cares about your personality when you're applying to graduate school. If you have an economics professor, if you've taken an economics class, you know that they don't care about your personality. So what should you be putting in your statement of purpose? You need to be demonstrating that you know what you're getting yourself into. I think a lot of people apply to PhD programs or graduate programs generally, not knowing what they're going into. They just know that this is school, I'm going to apply to school, 
and I'm just gonna keep going with education in my life because I don't know what else I'm gonna do if I don't go to school. That's not how you should handle a statement of purpose. Statement of purpose is for you to say, I am qualified to get into this program. Let me remind you of my qualifications and let me tell you what I'm gonna do once I get in there. What did I put in my statement of purpose? I remember the first thing I put was, here are the qualifications that I have. I am undoubtedly qualified to get into a PhD program. And then the second half was outlining my research ideas. At the time I was interested in behavioral economics and what I had done was written a little web scraping program, which I've talked about that skill in this video up here. You should definitely be getting that skill to scrape an auction website and get data on bids. And I was interested in this behavioral aspect of bidding. And so I wrote out that was what I was interested in. This is the data I'm collecting to answer that question. And through that statement, the application committee, the, the admissions committee, they can see this guy knows what he's getting himself into. He knows how to formulate a research question. He knows how to get data to answer that question. And if you can do that on your statement of purpose, you are really going to stand out. Now, the way that you do that is you look for research that you're interested in, especially research done by professors at the school you're applying to. If you can say, this professor is looking at this question and I think I can contribute to that by doing this other way of answering the question. Man, that is really going to stand out to those admissions committees. So make sure that you are articulating why you're qualified to get into that program and the research that you would be interested in. And especially if you can, please give them a research question and what you would do to answer that research question. Those kind of things are just gonna make you stand out and make them see that you know what you're getting yourself into. The key to all of this is making sure that you're giving information whose marginal value is not zero. Make sure that all of your pieces of your application are contributing something unique and important to get you accepted to those schools. Now, I talk a lot about economics and majoring in economics as well as economics in the real world. So go ahead and check out these videos if you're interested in that kind of content. And please sure to leave me a comment telling me what kind of program you're applying to. We'll see you next time on Market Power.